welcome to Wiser Dialogue, conversations with women of color about issues, policies, and research that impact our lives. Today, we have two masters in social work students, Sheldon Jones and Gina Vita. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Thank you for having us. Thank so, you. So, um, this is the month that we talk about issues around parental rights. Last year, we talked a little bit about foster care and child protective services. So I'm really excited to have two young folks who are doing work in social work. We always hear that the longer folks have been in social work, that they tend to be a little more dated. So I'm, I'm happy to have a fresh perspective. So I wanna start by asking you both, why social work? What was it about social work that drew your interest. So Gina, I know you said to me earlier that you also did your undergraduate work in, in social work. So, so why don't we start with you? So tell me why social work, both as an undergrad and then uh, to do a master's degree. So social work gives me a lot of different options to do different things. So I went in because I wanted to be a therapist. And then on my undergrad, I did my internship in a family visitation center, which was totally different from therapy. But I realized that I could do that as a social worker, like a, a part-time job or something, and still in the social work field, but a total different thing. And that's why I chose social work, just the different options. Social workers are the primary ones who do therapy. And most people think that psychologists are the ones who do that, but no. <laughs> so if you want to be a therapist, social work can be one of the things that you can choose. So how about you, Sheldon? So I chose social work for similar reasons as Gina. I like the fact that there was a lot of variety. Anywhere you can do foster care, you can do adoption, you can do CPS, you can work in a hospital setting, you can be a therapist, which is what I actually wanted to be. But I also, I've just always been, like even from a young age, I've always been that friend that just wanted to go the extra mile to help out. And that's a trait that I kind of noticed about myself early on. And I just kind of realized over the years that social work would probably be the best fit for me. Sheldon, where was your internship as an undergrad? My internship was at a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center called Focus Point Behavioral Health. I really enjoyed working with that population. It was definitely a learning experience and it's something that I'm open to doing like in the future. Both of you were, uh, were both interested in therapy. Now, are you thinking therapy in terms of the adult population or do you have a population that you have a particular interest in? I personally like working with young adults. Like, <laughs> that's just me. Like, children, I love, like, I love, you know, babysitting, like things like that. Like I like, you know, that, but working with them, like, you know, getting them to express themselves is very difficult for me. I don't think that I would do well. I don't think that I'd be the best person for that population. But then again, I did like doing child welfare, like, you know, CPS. So I don't know, but what people don't really recognize about CPS is that generally you're working with parents, not the children like you do obviously have to have that interaction with the children um because you have to do safety checks you have to go pull them out of school and stuff like that but usually you're working with parents so i personally see myself working with the adult um or even maybe young adult population i'm gonna come back to that because i think that you're right people probably don't think about cps as more so working with the adults because it says child protective services. So I think many of us tend to think about most of the interaction is with the child, not with the parent. So we will definitely come back and, and we'll love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. And so for you, Gina, in terms of therapy, do you have a population in mind? So I like adults as well. No handle to hear about abuse on children or you know to hear about bad things that happen to kids like I, I just I could not like I would be too invested in that and I don't think that the mom and me would be able to step back <laughs> I will be trying to mother these kids or try to tell the, their parents what to do you know like it wouldn't be a good fit for me. 
I'm glad to hear you say, you know, the mother in you would have a difficult time, you know, to take a step back, because I think that's important in the professions that we do to recognize what, what our limitations are. Mm -hmm. All right, so Sheldon, I want to come back to you and, and, and talk just a little bit more about what you were saying about child protective services and in yeah. terms of interacting with, with the parent. And, and Gina, if you also have experience in this space, feel, feel, free to, feel free to chime in as well. So would you talk a little bit more about that, Sheldon? What happens at CPS, and you know, I'm not an expert. I, I did have an internship um, for a short while there. But what I know happens is that we receive reports and then the, re the um, cases are given to workers. So what we do is, let's say that there's a child, the report might say something like, the child is sleeping on the floor and there's no food in the house. What we would do is we might go to the, to the school to talk to the child with the permission of the parents if it's an alternative response. If it's an investigation, it might be a little bit different. But then after we talk to the child, after getting permission, we would go to the parent and talk to them about, okay, what's going on in the household? Is there food in the household? You know, we would do, we would walk around the house, check the refrigerator, check the child's like living space and just kind of like conduct an assessment. But most of the work would be with the parent. Like, okay, mom, like I know that you don't have food in the house. How can we get food in the house? You know, I, I see that there aren't, um, there isn't an appropriate, you know, space for the child to sleep. How can we, you know, move forward and get the child some, you know, somewhere that's, that's good for them to sleep. So it's more so working with the parents just to just kind of create a better environment for the child. You know, CPS workers are not looking to remove children from the home. Obviously, yes, it does happen because there are situations where the child's just better off not in the house at that time period. But that's not our goal. Our goal is to try to say, what are the issues and what solutions can we come up with so that the child can stay in the home or so that you can create a better environment for the child and a better situation for yourself? <laughs> a lot of times it is not just a parent being, I don't want to say a bad parent, but it can be a misconnect in terms of the need for resources and then being aware that there are resources available. So, so is, that, is that about right in, in what you're talking about in terms of thinking about the assessments and when we're asking questions like, how can we help you get food? How can we help you get right. food? It, it's about connecting with community resources. Right, absolutely. It's not so much about um, placing blame on anybody. It's just about trying to improve the conditions of the situation so that there are no risk of, of, of child removal or anything like that. Obviously, there are cases where, okay, yes, like they're investigations because they're very serious. But most CPS cases are, or many of them, let me say that, many of them are, are just, you know, what can we do to help? What can we do to, to, to make things better? And that's really it. I, that, I think that, that is a, that's, that's an important part because it's, it is not at all what you hear about CPS, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> when you hear CPS is coming, folks are like, oh my God, like I'm going to lose my child. And oh, so yeah. I, I really am, I'm really appreciative of that, right? Gina, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come, come back to you. And so you said that you worked at, you had an internship at a family visitation center and, and thinking about what, what Sheldon has said about coming in there and doing the assessment and figuring out what's needed. Do you have experience in this space as well? No, not really. Because our center was for uh, parents who didn't have custody of their children, so they could visit them in our space. So they came to us, we didn't go to them. And it was challenging sometimes because, you know, parents who don't have custody, like there's a reason behind that. But when they came to us, they showed their ve their best behavior and they were like this extraordinary parent and they have this, you know, this 
highest standards for their kids. And it was like, the kids just saw them one hour. Like some of them only saw them every two weeks or something. So like the kids didn't really know them as their parents. Like some of them were in foster care. So they didn't have none of their parents. And then other kids were there because a really bad divorce they couldn't just settle visitations in their own so they had to involve us so it was different because they they were there and they were in their best behavior like it wasn't like we are going to your house and we're gonna see you for who you are so it was different parents know that they're coming it's a, you know it's a different kind of of prep and you know that you're being watched as opposed to mm -hmm. I might watch you you know come into your environment so so thank you thank you about that so you all are both in the Maryland um, what they like to refer to as the DMV the DC Maryland Virginia area um, and you've got a more diverse population than where I am outside of Richmond so in your training okay, do they talk to you all about cultural differences in populations so that you can be aware of how you interact because your population is very diverse so so is that part of your curriculum to think about cultural sensitivity yes yes we have a class that is all about culture and privilege and oppression and so we get to talk about ourselves and and us being different and and talk about the privilege that some of some of them have and the oppression that people of color like me experience every day so it's like I love that class so it was part of our training yes like going off of what Gina was saying like we did have an entire class dedicated to talking about privilege and oppression and how it affects you know just everything people's you know daily lives and everything but we're also so salisbury is in a, is is in a, it's considered a royal rural, rural area and one thing that is talked about a lot is the importance of confidentiality because it is a smaller area um, one thing they talk about is the importance of when you're working with clients you know not talking you know just being careful about the things that you say you know, how you should act when you see a client in public and things like that, because it is such a small, it's a smaller area. Uh, so that's also something that kind of goes along with it, definitely. I'm also, I'm, I'm glad to hear you, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because, again, I don't think, I don't think most of us think about, right, that this population that you might have done a, a home visit to, you might run into in the grocery store, right? And, and, and I'm sure that there is a, an odd kind of tension in, in both spaces, right, in terms of, of thinking of that. And, and again, I don't think that people, I, I don't want to, I think we don't think about CPS sometimes as a rural issue, right? We think of only as urban spaces where you have challenges in, in family structures and not, not so much rural. So my next question is one that I like to, to ask all of my guests. So tell me, um, about a myth that you hear around social work, and it can be anything that you hear that you wish people would start perpetuating. So I want you to tell me what's the myth and then why it's not true. And and I'll start with you, Gina. I think that the myth is that social workers are the one who take people away from their parents. So... <laughs> That's what we hear all the time that social workers are. I'm like, no, I'm a, I, I want to be a therapist, and that's not what I do. Like, that's not my field at all. <laughs> and we don't take children away from their parents just because. <laughs> so I think like that's the biggest myth about social workers, and no, it's not true. <laughs> so going on what Gina said, that is the biggest myth. When I tell people that. I'm a social work major. The first thing they say is, oh, so you're trying to take people's children. You know, they kind of make, you know, jokes like that. And, you know, not only do we not take, well, I don't take children. I was only, you know, I was an intern, so I didn't quite get that, you know, to that level. But not only do CP work, CPS workers not 
take children for no reason. It's also something that they don't enjoy doing. And that's not the goal. The goal is to keep children with their families because children like being with the people they know. You know, whether it's dysfunctional or not, or whether there's some issues within the household, all of that, children like being with people that they know. So that's not something that, that it, that's kind of like a last resort situation. And even when children are removed from the home, we try to put them with people like that they know. So maybe like uh, family friends, maybe relatives that can care for them, things like that. But that's definitely the biggest misconception um, that I hear a lot. Thank you both ladies. Again, my guests, Sheldon Jones and Gina Vides, both are masters in social work at Salisbury State University. Thank you ladies for being my guests. You have been watching Wiser Dialogue, The Missing Viewpoint.